thank you. Oh my gosh, all the glory to God, because it ain't about me, that's for sure. If it was about me, then, yeah, I wouldn't be standing here. So, yeah, we went up to the retreat last weekend. Um, God had put on my heart that what he wanted for the women was, uh, the, the, the theme was brought to life, perfect surrender. So um, he told me that women, that women were going to be, things were going to be broken and women were going to come back changed. And, you know, he never fails to meet his promises uh, far beyond what he promises and his expectations. So it was really amazing. I hope that um, for those women who couldn't go that, you know, begin to pray about it, that God would move you to be able to come next year. Um, I believe that part of the message that I have today is actually because of what I witnessed up there. So I'm going to go ahead and pray before we get started. Father, I thank you, Lord God, right now. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that we can be gracefully broken before you, Lord God. I thank you that I can come before you with all that I have, Father, and I can lay it at your feet. And I can ask you to take it, Lord, and I can just be yours. Even if it's just for a moment, Father God, and I can just be yours, I can let go of everything, Father. I pray, Lord, right now that, that that's exactly what would happen, Lord God, that the things that you've put on my heart, Father God, the things that you've put inside of me, Lord, the things that you have for my brothers and sisters, Father, today would be from you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about when I was a little girl. So I think that most women in here, I know it's Mother's Day, so I kind of try to think about what, you know, what, what would mothers want to hear, but, you know, there's a lot of men in here today, too, so the message isn't just for the women, it's for the men, too, but when I was a little girl, and, and I'm probably not the only one, um, I spent a lot of time, like, fantasizing about when I grow up what I wanted my life to be like, what I thought I should be like, what my perfect knight in shining armor should be like, what, you know, what I was going to do in this world, where I was going to go, who I was going to be, how I was going to get there. And I, I don't know about anybody else, but I used to play things out with my friends with Barbie dolls. We would stay up all night and play things out with Barbie dolls. And we would ha like literally create these, these lives with our Barbie dolls. And they were, for the most part, good, but sometimes not so good. Sometimes things happened in those situations where there was jealousy, there was um, broken relationships, there were hurt feelings, but there was also a lot of love and kindness and, and just building ourselves up and, you know, I want to be this, I want to be loved. I want to feel important. Isn't that what we want when, we, when we're growing up? We want to feel loved and we want to feel important. Um, I used to spend a lot of time also just creating these, um, I guess I'll call them fantasies, maybe dreams in my mind, you know, of who I wanted to be. You know, a lot of times when you're little, you want to be famous. Oh, it would be so great to be famous, God, for everybody to know who I am. Only that back then I wasn't talking to God. I didn't know God. But back then it was just this creation in my mind of who, how wonderful it would be, how important I would feel, and how loved I would feel if I had all of these people following me, and all of these people looking at me, and all of these people wanting to be like me, and wanting to be what I am. Um, you know, not knowing at all what the world had in store for me. So, I hope I'm not alone in that, but I did spend a lot of time doing that, thinking about, you know, if I was prettier, if I was, you know, if my body was shaped differently, if I didn't have this trait or that trait. As we grow up, we start to become things. We start to find our identity. Unfortunately, we don't always find our identity in God. For the most part, we find it in ourselves first. Not everybody has the benefit of growing up in church, and even if you do, you still have a tendency to, you know, want to spread your wings and be who you think that you should be, who maybe you've imagined and that you should be growing up. Whatever your heart desires, that's that's what you go after, and it's not always what what we're meant to be. But when we grow up, we we become all kinds of things. Um, it's Mother's Day, so we become wives and we become mothers. We become, before that even, daughters and sisters. We become um, grandmothers later on. Yeah. We go to school to become, to become what we think we want to be, what we want to do in our lives, teachers, lawyers, doctors. 
whatever whatever passion that we've had growing up I don't know I watch my daughter and my children now and I see things in them and I see what I think that they should be and where they're going I can see their gifts but it's funny how they don't see it they think they want to be something else and they go after it and that's and that's fine that's the way that it goes eventually God is going to show them so we go to school to become whatever it is. We go for our bachelors, our masters, our PhDs, and we become, I am a doctor, I am a lawyer, I am a teacher. Let's not even go after a PhD. Let's just say, you know what, God, I think that I should be a mechanic or I should be a plumber. It doesn't have to be something big. It's whatever we think we should be. We become whatever our job says that we are. Wherever we work. I am this because I work here. I am that because I go there. We get married and like I said, we become wives and husbands. We move on, we become mothers and fathers. Grandmothers, grandfathers, aunts, uncles. All of these things that we become because of the things going on around us in the world or because of choices that we've made. When we have our children, let's go beyond becoming parents. We become PTA members and soccer coaches and dance moms and cheer moms. And we become nurses. We become comforters and caregivers. We become all of these things just because we become mothers or parents. We, be, we can get a, a promotion at work. You get a promotion at work, you become the vice president or the president or whatever other title they want to give you. And that is who you become. You meet people. And we tend to become something because of who we meet. We become their friend. We become their companion. We become their neighbor, their coworker. We discover our gifts. And we become those things. We become pastors. We become teachers. We become evangelists. We become prophets. We become all of these things when our gifts come about. And when we find our purpose, we become even greater. We become whatever our purpose is. So whatever the call is that God has on your life. Are you called to love? Are you called to give? Are you called to help? So all of these things that happen around us in our lives become part of who we identify ourselves as. All of a sudden, I am a doctor. I am a teacher. I am a mom. And that becomes our identity. And we stand on it, and we stand behind it. And it becomes everything that we are. And sadly, you know, all of those things have to come to an end at some point. So what happens when your kids grow up and go away? Then what? Your whole identity has been based on being, being their mother and being their caregiver. And then they're gone. Then who are you? You're left in an identity crisis, right? What happens when you retire? You're no longer the doctor anymore. Now what? Who are you? You know, not only are there good things that we can be identified with, but we can be identified with some pretty negative things as well. The world places them on us. We place them on ourselves. It's things that maybe we've gotten ourselves into. Um, I, I'm an addict. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a loser. I'm a player. <laughs> I mean, let's be real. We do these things. Think about, I hear things in the world. I hear... I'm standing in line at the grocery store at Wal or at Walmart, that's the, the biggest place, and it never fails that I hear somebody standing behind me and the, every other word out of their mouth, a beautiful young woman, the, every other word out of her mouth is a foul word, and it breaks my heart because she doesn't know who she is. Her identity is in that, is in, um... I mean, because women do it too. It's not just men who think they're big and bad and macho. For whatever reason, they think that's who they are. They have to be this person in order to be liked, in order to be loved, in order to be whoever they think that they are created to be. 
But that's not who we are. But we get caught up in all these things and we forget. Even as Christians, we get caught up in all these things and we forget. We forget where our identity comes from and who we really were created to be. Because our identity doesn't come from any of those things. It doesn't come from any of those things. It's all part of it's all part of who we are. It's all part of the life that God has laid out for us. It's it's all bits and pieces of who God created us to be. But our true identity, our true identity is in Christ. And it is in Christ alone. He created us. He created us for all of those purposes, to do all of those things, not the negative things, obviously. He didn't create us for any of those things. He knew it was going to happen, but He didn't create us for that. And He does use them for His glory, and He does use them for His good, and for our good, and for the good of our brothers and sisters. But, He didn't create us to be identified by any of those things in our lives. Not a one. Our true identity lies in Him. It's not found in what we do or who we think we are or the life path that we follow. It's not ident my identity is not in who I'm married to or who I work for or where I go to school. My identity is not even in, in my gift or my purpose. My identity is simply that I am a daughter of the King. Amen. I'm a child of God and that's my identity. Thank God He's given me all of those other things to use. But they are not who I am. They don't define me. They don't define who my identity is. My identity is in Christ. So when you're doing all of these things, you are His. When you are a mom, you're His. When you're a wife, you're His. If you're a waitress, when you're waiting tables, you're His. When you're a teacher, you're His. When you're out ministering to people on the street, you are His. When someone approaches you in a grocery store or, hey, in a parking lot, maybe you're getting some road, ra road rage, guess what? In that moment, you're His. And if you allow Him to, He will take control of those moments for you. When you're broken, like the song talked about being gracefully broken, when you are broken, you are His. When you're lost, when you don't know who you are, you're His. When you feel alone, for whatever reason, because we're never alone, but when you feel alone, you're His. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, no matter where you were born, who you were born to, no matter what happens in your life, no matter what choices you make, you are His. You are always His. And that's what we need to keep in our minds. That I am a child of God. Amen. Forget all the titles. Forget all of my abilities. All my responsibilities. Forget all of those things. And just remember whose I am. So I actually have um, quite a bit of scripture that I wanted to share with you guys today. So I'm going to start in 1 John chapter 3. You know, God put so much on my heart. There's just so much, so, so much that I wish I could say, but I'm going to stick to what he tells me to say right now. So just bear with me. So First uh, John chapter 3, verse 1 says, See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. How much more clear can it get? It says it right there. In black and white. See how very much our Father loves us. He loves us. If only you knew how much He loves you. I think that some, some of us really have no idea. Really have no idea. We say it. We think it, but do we really, really know it deep down in our hearts how much God loves us? Do we really believe that He calls us His children? You know, when I read scripture, I'm just going to share this from the beginning because I might do it. Um, I personalize it. Make it all about you. It's okay to be selfish. He is your father. He is your daddy. Yes, he 
He's all of our Father, but He's yours. And you, like Pastor says it all the time, he's, I'm His favorite. Be His favorite. He loves you. See how very much my Father loves me. He calls me His child, and that is what I am. Yes. Say it to yourself until you believe it. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 says all for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God you know the enemy wants to get in our head and tell us that we're all kinds of other things or what about when we make a mistake and he wants to tell us we want to start believing we even tell it to ourselves I'm not worthy I'm not good enough I feel you feel so full of shame that you just kind of distance yourself from God. I don't feel like I can go near to him right now because I messed up. I made a mistake. But he says for all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. As parents, would you ever if your kid messed up and made a mistake, which they do, right? All the time, do you say, "Oh, I can't love you today." You messed up. Not today. You're going to have to stay over there today. Keep your distance because you messed up. We don't do that to our children. God would never do that to us. you got to think about it this way. The love that you have for your children is... The only way that I can think about it is the love that I have for my children. God's is like times a hundred, billion, trillion, thousand, million, whatever. The biggest number in the whole world. Infinity. Bigger than that. Amen. Going on to Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, it says... It tells us that we are his heirs his ch and his own children. So it says, and because we are his children, God has spent, sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer slaves, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. So a little bit earlier in this chapter, it's talking about how um, when you receive the inheritance of the Father, you're no longer a slave. You become His child. It's like you're not a slave to anything anymore. You're not a slave to Him. You now belong to Him. You've inherited Him. You've inherited everything that He has for you. Because we are his children, he has sent his, the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call him Abba Father. The spirit of his son into our hearts. He lives inside of you. He's dwelling in us. We're an heir to everything that he has. I think that's just like huge. It's probably more than we can even fathom. It just seems too great. Like if somebody were to just come up and say, hey, I want to give you a billion dollars. Wouldn't that just be like, whoa, I don't even know what to do with it. And money is probably not a good way of looking at it. But maybe the greatest desire of your heart that you ever wanted, somebody just comes up and, and wants to give it to you. Well, God's already given it to us. We inherited it before we were even born. It's our inheritance. That means it's already ours. You don't have to do anything to earn it. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to be the greatest child in the world. You don't have to walk perfectly before him or anybody else. You're never going to lose it. Not unless you decide to walk away from it. He's never going to take it from you. It's your inheritance. You can't be written out of his will. He's not going to do that. So being a child of God means one very, very, well, one very important thing that God really, this is where it came, came in at the retreat, very strong, is that we are chosen. Yes. You just didn't happen to be a child of God. Yes. He chose you. He created you. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. Nothing about you should be any different than it is. 
He created you exactly the way that He wanted you to be made. The way you look, the color of your hair, the color of your eyes, your build, your height, the way you walk, the way you talk, your personality. All of it. He made it. He did, and he didn't just like we did like pulling tickets out of a out of a raffle and say, oh, uh, this one's gonna have red hair. No, he thought about you. You, you are in. He thought about you. Exactly how he wanted you to be. And he and he created you meticulously. So Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 2 says, You have been set apart as holy to the Lord your God. And he has chosen you from all the nations of the earth to be his own special treasure. Now I know that the, the Old Testament is and this is, is talking about the children of Israel, but you know what? It's all for us. Every single word of it. It's not, oh, it's Old Testament, it doesn't apply to me. No, it's all for us. Every single word of it. You have been set apart as holy. You're holy. You're set apart as holy. You, I don't know how it could be any more clear that you are not just a happenstance. He chose you from all the nations of the earth to be his own special treasure. You're a treasure. Does anybody here own a treasure? Do you have something that you treasure with your heart, with all your heart? Maybe, I mean, usually for us, I mean, okay, Will, your children, right? Maybe it's, an, maybe it's something that got handed down to us. Maybe it is something like, you know, a piece of jewelry or a piece of clothing or something that got handed down from generation to generation to generation. That's a treasure to us, isn't it? Because it's an inheritance. It's been passed down to us. He treasures us. Ephesians chapter 1. Even before he made the world. Even before he made the world. Okay, how long ago did he make the world? Does anybody know? And how old are you? Hello? Even before he made the world, God loved you and chose you in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Even before he made the world, oh my gosh, before Adam and Eve, before he made the world, we all know what he did when he made the world. I mean, we look around us every day. How much time and effort did he put into the world? All the creatures that walk around, that swim in the ocean, that fly in the sky. How about the colors that we see all around us? And that's not his children. So if he put that much care into creating the world, how much more care did he put into creating you? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Psalm 139. I had to do it, because this is where it's at. 13 through 16 says, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. All of them. Think about how it works, how your body works, how it just, everything works. It can even heal itself. He created our body to be able to heal. We have an immune system to heal ourselves. He cre he, you made all of the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. In my mother's womb. So you knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. 
Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Before he made the world, every moment was laid out for your life. Yours. Don't think about anybody else. Think about you. Be selfish for a minute. It's okay. We're allowed to do that. We're allowed to have that time with our Father and make it be all about me. It just blows me away that, you know, because, like I said, I didn't grow up with, with God in my life. I didn't know God. I knew of God, but I didn't know God. But to know that He knew me before, long before I did, and that not only that He knew me, but He was with me. And he was watching over me, and he was caring for me, and he was guiding me, even though I didn't know he was there. I can think back to times in my life now when I was a child, and there's moments that he's shared with me since I've known him, that he was there in that moment. That that was because of him. That those things that that, that didn't happen because I was there to catch you. That you didn't lose everything because I was there. Even though you didn't know me, I knew where you were going. I knew what was in your heart. I knew who I created you to be. So he made us. I think it's amazing. If you just take a minute, just a minute to sit and think about how your body works. It's amazing. It's not just, I mean, it's amazing. Anybody likes biology or science or studied any of that? It's absolutely amazing. Um, the things that happen in our brains and our minds and the way that our thoughts cr grow and create things in our minds constantly. It, it's amazing. You should Google it sometime. Oh, that's all I got to say. Um, James chapter 1 verse 18 says he chose to give birth to you by giving you his true word and we you out of all creation became his prized possession there it is again you're his treasure you're his prized possession Think about how much, again, think about how much you love your prized possession. Oh my gosh, if, it, if I lost it, if it broke, if I couldn't find it, if it was taken from me, how heartbroken would you be? How heartbroken would you be if you lost that thing or that person? Each and every one of us is that to God. We are each His prized possession. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. I told you guys I have a lot of scripture. God has a lot to say. If you read his word, and this is only some of it, God has a lot to say about you and his love for you. When I, when I read it, I've gotten to this place where I'm just like, you know, God, I just want to hear from you. And no matter what I read, I, I just, I need more of you and I need it to be alive and breathing for me. And... He never fails. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. And you, a lot of you probably know this one. For we are God's masterpiece. His masterpiece. And we don't like ourselves. Hmm. Every single one of us in this room has something about ourselves, at least one thing, probably more, that we don't like about ourselves. Wow. It makes my heart cringe to think that we're literally telling God, you made a mistake. You didn't make me right. This part's wrong, God. You should have did it this way. If I would have did it, I would have did it like that. 
but it says that we are his masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago before he made the world. He has created you anew in Christ Jesus so you can do the good things that he planned for you. Because he has a plan for each and every one of our lives. There are things that you can do that nobody else can do. And I know that's hard to believe because even with our gifts, we look around and we see, you know, well, so-and-so has the same gift as I do. And so-and-so has the same gift as I do. And, that, and that's true. We, we do carry a lot of the same gifts. But the way we carry them and the way we use them is unique to you and you alone. And that's why when they say that there's some things that you can only do, only you can do. I used to think, you know, God, if there's something that I'm supposed to do, you tell me to do something, you tell me to go say something to somebody, and I fail, and I don't do it. Now, have I stolen that person's blessing? Absolutely not. I've robbed myself. But God's going to put somebody else to bless that person. He will never rob somebody else because you didn't be obedient to what he was calling you to do. So don't let the enemy put that in your head. But guess what's going to happen? You are going to begin to feel this conviction inside your heart. And it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger until you start to step out in faith and be obedient to what God's asking. You're going to get to a point where... Oh my God, I, I can't not do it because I can't stand to feel that way. I can't stand to feel like I've let you down. So you are his masterpiece. There's things that he created you and you alone to do. Good things that he planned for you. So don't ever think, that's not for me, God. I can't do that. If he's put it in your heart, guess what? Yes, you can. With him. Never alone. You know the, the scripture, um, you can do all things through Christ. But he never said, like the word said, he never said you can do all things through you. You can do all things through Kim. I can do all things by myself. No, I can't. I've tried to do things by myself. Believe me, control is one of the things that we, especially as I think women growing up in the generation that I grew up in, we were taught to be strong women, independent. We don't need anybody. We can raise our kids by ourselves. We can run our household by ourselves. We don't need a man. We don't need anybody. And what does that tell a, a, a little girl? You don't need God either. You only need you. Be dependent on you and you alone. But that's not how we were created. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Okay, that was a bonus. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. Okay. <laughs> So you know also, like we talked about already, that God comes in and, and lives inside of us, right? And we become the temple of God. Jesus died so that that could happen. He was born as a human being, came and lived and grew up, and was tortured and suffered and treated horribly and terribly, and then was tortured physically I mean, to the point where he was unrecognizable. I mean, I watch The Passion of the Christ, and I think to myself, I bet you that's only just a, a bit of what it actually looks like. But it's enough for me. He did all of that, and then allowed himself to be nailed. Think about it. Have huge nails through his hands and his feet so that you could have life. So that you could have his spirit inside of you. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 19 says, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself. 
For God bought you with a high price. You do not belong to yourself. You're, you're, you are a child of God. Amen. You are a child of God. That is your identity. That is who you are. You belong to Him. Yes. He created you for a purpose. I love how it says, don't you realize? And when I read stuff like that, it's like God, I feel like He's sitting right in front of me. And He's not saying it with like this, don't you realize? He's saying like, don't you get it? Can't you see how much I love you? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who was given to you by God. He bought it with a high price. What was that high price? His son. Could you send your son to be treated the way that Jesus was treated? To be sacrificed? I don't think there's many of us that could say, yes, I would send my child through all of that for anything. Um, Ephesians chapter 2 again, verse 21. We are carefully joined together in Him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. So we are joined together with Christ to become the holy temple of the Lord. You're never alone. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You have Jesus living inside of you. You have your Father inside. They, they're like you're surrounded. I like that song. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. You're surrounded. It's okay. It's not. It, it's a good kind of surrounded. It's okay. Let yourself be surrounded. You're not putting your. You're being vulnerable, but you're not putting yourself in a vulnerable position where anything is ever going to harm you. You're putting yourself in the best, most vulnerable position that you could ever be in by allowing yourself to be surrounded by Him. Joined with Christ. That's a hard one to grasp too. That was really hard for me to grasp. That God, that Jesus wanted to be right there with me. And, and like literally I can walk anywhere. I can go anywhere and have a conversation with him. I don't have to be in my morning devotion, on my knees before him, in a quiet room, in my prayer closet. I can talk to him anytime, anywhere. It doesn't matter. He's always going, it's always, constantly. I've had, to, I mean, I've trained myself. I had to train myself because my mind wants to go other places. To constantly be talking to him about what's going on in my life. And, and that means everything. Every decision that you have to make. It's not just when bad things start to happen or you're, you find yourself in a pickle that you, and you're desperate. Oh God, I need you. No. Oh God, I need you. Every morning, every day of my life, every moment, I need you. I don't even want to begin to think about the decisions I have to make today without you. Because we make decisions all day long. All day long. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. He watches over us. Chapter 7 verse 16 says, For I have chosen this temple and set it apart to be holy, a place where my name will be honored forever. I will always watch over it, for it is dear to my heart. There it is again. We're going back to Him choosing you. You are His temple. I have chosen this temple. He's chosen you. I have chosen you and set you apart to be holy. A place where my name will be honored. And that's something that we can think about in the things that we do every day. God, I want to honor you. Is what I just said or how I just talked to that person, does that honor you? Is the decision that I just made, does that honor you? Does that honor who you are in my life? If people look at me, are they going to see you? Are they going to think, wow, 
I don't know what that is, but I don't know anybody who would make a decision like that. And I'm not talking like you did something stupid crazy. I'm talking like you did something that only Jesus would do. And they don't know what it is because they don't recognize it because they don't know him. But they can see it. And then you're the light shining in that darkness. And what I really love about this verse... It says, I will always watch over it. He's talking about his temple. The holy place that's set apart. I will always watch over it. For it is dear to my heart. He's not going to allow his spirit to come and live inside of you and then take off and be like, so, peace out, you're on your own. You can do what you want with it. Figure it out. I hope you figure it out. I, I did all that I can. I gave it to you now. You're on your own. Sink or swim. No. He's always going to watch over it. He's going to watch over you because you are his temple and his spirit lives inside of you. Amen. And you're dear to his heart. A treasure. A prized possession. A masterpiece. Yes. Without fault in his eyes. When we were at the retreat, um, I gave the women um, three roses. One red rose and two white roses. And, it, and the red rose represented the blood of Christ. And the white roses represented being washed clean and the new creation. And so I think about that when I think about you know, what he did for us. And we, he sees us without fault. Why? Because Jesus already paid the price. He already died on the cross. His blood was shed. The victory is there. It's already been won. We don't have to carry that. But yet we want to walk around like this. Carrying all that weight. And you know that brings to me... Uh, I actually was reading through my journals because God just speaks to me in, in my prayer time. And one of the things is that he said to me, I was. I was walking just a few weeks ago with that heaviness, with my head held down and feeling defeated. And he said to me, why do you do that? You are not defeated. You are my child. The victory is won because I already paid the price. You have no reason to ever walk with your head held down. I don't care what you've done or what you've been through. You have no reason to ever walk with your head held down. You've been washed clean by the blood. Yes. Psalm 46. Psalm 46 verses 4 and 5. A river brings joy to the city of our God. The sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. A river brings joy to the city of our God. A river brings joy to the city of our God. We are the temple, the city of God. The river is the truth of God, the word of God that will bring joy to your life. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I say it all the time because you know what? If there's one thing I know more than anything, one of the things I know more than anything else is that we were created to be joyful. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. We're supposed to have it every day, all the time. It's ours. We have a choice, though. Because God's not going to make us happy. He's not going to be like, you're going to be joyful today whether you like it or not. No. We have a choice. We can choose joy. Or we can choose defeat. Or misery. Or anger. Or bitterness. Or whatever else we might want to choose to carry around with us. Because guess what? Is bitterness, anger, defeat in the fruits of the Spirit? I don't see it anywhere in the Bible as something that God gave to us. If it is not one of the things he gave to us, then we do not have to carry it. Amen. We don't. But we have to keep telling ourselves that. You know, we have to be reminded. Ask God, Holy Spirit, God, please today just show me where I'm carrying something I shouldn't be carrying. And he's going to show you. Whatever you ask for, and you really want, and you believe, you will receive says it in the Word of God. 
A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. The sacred home. You're holy. You're set apart. You're sanctified. God dwells in that city, and it cannot be destroyed. It cannot be destroyed, because God dwells there. From the very break of day, God will protect it. He will protect you. He will protect what he's given you. He will protect where he's sending you. He goes before me and he follows me. And I say that every day too. You go before me and you follow me, God. Your hand of blessing is upon my head everywhere I go. Make that way. Protect me, Lord. Protect my family. Protect my children. Protect my household. Yes. Protect everything that you've given me. Psalm 16, verses 5 and 6. Lord, you alone are my inheritance, my cup of blessing. You guard all that is mine. The land you have given me is a pleasant land. What a wonderful inheritance. You alone are my inheritance, my cup of blessing. You guard all that is mine. Remember all those things we talked about earlier? All those pieces of your life? All those pieces of your life that he's, that he's blessed you with, that he's assigned to you, that he's put into your life? He will guard all that is mine. That's all mine. He gave it to me. It's not my identity, but he gave it to me. It's part of my life. It's pieces of my life. It's pieces of, of, of who I am and how I live and what I do. And since he gave it to me, he's going to guard it. Have you ever noticed how something or somebody in your life, you just can't keep it? Like no matter how, how bad you want it, it just seems to keep walking away or getting taken away or falling away? Hmm, maybe it's not yours. Maybe it's not meant to be in your life. God's not guarding it because it's not yours. Just a thought. The land you have given me is a pleasant land. What a wonderful inheritance. You know, no matter how difficult my children might be that day, they are a blessing and they are a gift from God. Amen. And they are my wonderful inheritance. And what is to come in my future, hopefully with grandchildren, many years from now. <laughs> my son's sitting back there. I don't care if you're 18. Many years from now. <laughs> the land you have given me is a pleasant land. He's not going to give you things that are going to make you miserable. He's not. He wants you to be full of joy. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to give. He wants you to receive. He wants you to have a pleasant land and a wonderful inheritance. So being God's child... The greatest gift of all means that I can depend on Him. You know, I, I, I tried to make a list because I say, God, you are my everything. And it just seems so generic. But I don't know what else to say sometimes because He, he literally is. Everything that I need or I want, He is. And I tried to make a list and it was like a whole page long. It was like three or four columns of all the things that God is in my life and then things just kept popping into my head popping into my head popping into my head I had it in my notes in my in my um, phone and it was like okay God I get it you are everything you are literally everything and that means that I can depend on him for everything and anything at any time in any place and all I want to do is honor him and serve him And I feel so blessed that he would allow me to be his vessel. I feel so blessed with all of the people that he surrounded me with. I feel so blessed for just even conversations that I get to have with people when someone comes to me and I'm, I'm able to just love them. 
Because I believe that that's really the biggest thing that God has given me is to love. And I know we're all created to love. Don't get me wrong. But for me, I know that's a big part of my purpose and my call is to love people. And so when I get the opportunity to do that, whether it's one-on-one or with a group of people or even in my prayer time, it's just amazing the feeling that you get when you are obedient and when you get to honor God with your life. And so I just have one last... um, one last, it's actually the whole chapter I'm going to read. Um, chapter 90, uh, 91 in Psalms. And I'm going to read this to you guys because this is, this is like something that I have read over and over and over. And I believe it for my life. And I pray it over my family. I pray it over my children. I pray it over my life. And this is, just, this is just one psalm that can give you a piece of what God is and what he will do for you. It's just a piece because if you read through the Psalms, it's, I mean, it's, the Psalms are amazing. If you want, if you want to really get down in, in that love with God, um, that's a good place to go. The, the whole Bible is amazing, obviously, but I'm saying the Psalms, it's like if you want to learn how to praise, if you want to learn how to give Him glory, if you want to learn how to honor Him, if you want to see what He is, read the Psalms. So Psalm 91 says, Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust Him. For He will rescue me from every trap and protect me from every deadly disease. He will cover me with his feathers. He will shelter me with his wings. His faithful promises are my armor and protection. I will not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. I will not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at my side, Though 10,000 are dying around me, these evils will not touch me. I open my eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If I make the Lord my refuge, if I make the Most High my shelter, no evil will conquer me. No plague will come near my home, for He will order His angels to protect me wherever I go. They will hold me up with their hands, so I won't even hurt my foot on a stone. I will trample upon lions and cobras. I will crush fierce lions and serpents under my feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. So I leave you with that with that chapter because like I said I it, it just it's everything that, that I need. One of the things that I just I just have to, to leave out there with you also is that um, you, your belief. I just really sense that some of us don't really believe that he is who he says he is. Or that I am who he says I am. And we might think we believe. But we don't really believe. Because we don't think we're good enough. Or we don't think we've done enough. Or we've made too many mistakes. How could you want me, God? Look at where I am. Look at what I did. But you have to believe. And if you don't believe, ask Him to help you believe. You can ask Him for anything. Anything. There's nothing left out of that. Anything. God, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to get past this. Maybe you don't realize you don't believe, but 
If you don't think something's going to happen for you, that God says is going to happen, guess what? You don't believe. You're doubting. If you are walking in a path that God has led you, and it gets hard and scary, so you go your own way, guess what? You don't believe. You don't believe that he's going to do what he said he was going to do. And sometimes that might sound harsh, and then, and then we might feel shame and guilt, but that's not what he intends. He doesn't bring it to our attention that we don't believe because he wants us to feel shame and guilt. He believes it, brings it to our attention because he wants us to believe, and he wants us to have freedom. He wants us to be free from whatever is going on inside of our heads, inside of our hearts, that is keeping us from believing that He is who He says He is. So I'm just going to ask if there's anybody here who thinks that they might not believe, or not fully believe, if you want to come forward, then I'm gonna, I'll pray, and anybody else who might want to come 